And with us now for our Your Health segment is Dr. David Eisenman, Associate Professor at the University of Maryland School of Medicine and Hearing Specialist and Surgeon at the University of Maryland Medical Center. Doctor, thank you for being with us. My pleasure, thanks for having me. Thank you for bringing your ear along. We yeah. will uh, get inside that, so to speak. But I wanted to talk broadly a little bit about the problem of hearing loss and, and hearing difficulty. Is this picking up in prevalence as A, people get older, people living longer, um, but B, you also have all these new uh, technologies, the uh, iPhones and your iPods and the little buds that go in your ear. Um, I imagine your schedule is pretty full. Uh, our schedule is full, not just with that, but both of those are, are factors that have led to hearing loss being a bigger public health problem. Uh, the aging population, living longer, uh, lets people have more age-related hearing loss, also more noise-related hearing loss because you're exposed to noise over a longer period of time. The earbuds, everyone likes to blame the earbuds. It's not really the earbuds. They're just the vehicle for getting sound to your ear. It's the digital players which make it so easy to listen all of the time in any kind of place that you are that are increasing people's noise exposure. On the age-related hearing loss, is it inevitable as we age, even if someone were kept in a sound, sterile environment, would their hearing deteriorate at some point? Yeah, to, to a certain extent, but not necessarily a whole lot. And we see people, octogenarians, uh, very you know, well up there with excellent, excellent hearing. But there's a lot of age-related hearing loss that is attributable just to the general noise exposure that people have. But what, what happens in here? Not, not to get too technical, but what's the problem? So with, with age-related hearing loss, it's, it's down in the inner ear, the cochlea. The, the, these are very delicate cells that pick up sound uh, and translate it into a signal that goes to the brain. Every time you're exposed to some sound or noise, those cells bend, and that's how they pick up sound, which is a, a mechanical wave and send it into an electrical or electrochemical signal that goes to the brain. If they just, they keep bending over and over and over, the more they're bent or the harder they're bent, they can, they can degenerate. How, how do we know when something is too loud? A good simple rule is that if it's uncomfortable, uh, it's too loud. But that's not always so simple because you have to look at the context in which you're listening to it. So you may be driving along uh, on a suburban street at a slow speed, listening to something which you think is comfortably loud, and then you pull onto the highway and you have to turn the volume up, especially if you have the windows down or something like that. And it may not feel uncomfortable to you anymore, but if you were back on the quiet street, it would be uncomfortable. So the, that's not always a perfect rule, but in general, if it's uncomfortable, you should lower it. Does hearing protection have to be bulky? You see those little foam earplugs, do, do they do the trick? Uh, they, they do them to a certain extent, but they're not great. Uh, the, the bigger headphones do have better hearing protection, but none of those things is perfect, and they're, they're, none of them is so convenient that they're ever gonna be used uh, routinely by people. People just need to be careful. Let me uh, remind our viewers, if you have a question about hearing loss or the treatment of that, which we will get to, uh, you can tweet it to at MPT News or hashtag your health. Uh, you can also call the number on the screen. And now let's talk to Raj in Baltimore City. Thank you very much for the call. Go ahead. Raj, you're on. Raj? Oh, thanks, for, uh, thanks for taking the call. Uh, sure. Uh, my wife has uh, tinnitus for nearly a year now, and she's been having um Raj, I think you're getting confused by the feedback there. Okay, yeah. well, let's, let's talk for a little bit about, um, I think that's ringing in the ears, Correct. right? Correct. So tinnitus is commonly called ringing in the ears. It could be any sound that you're hearing, not necessarily ringing, buzzing, roaring, ocean, crickets. People describe tinnitus as lots of different things. Most tinnitus is a consequence of hearing loss. Not all of it, but most of it. People think it's the noise in their ears that's stopping them from hearing, but it's, it's actually the reverse. They have the noise because they have some hearing loss. And a lot of tinnitus can be, A, prevented by being cautious about noise exposure, and B, treated by uh, hearing rehabilitation options. So if you have hearing loss and tinnitus, if you treat the hearing loss by whatever mechanism is available, 
uh, it will often diminish the severity, the intensity of the tinnitus. Now, when you say rehabilitation, um, I had always thought that, that it was permanent. Once your hearing was like some other things, when, when it's gone, it's gone. Are you talking about uh, application of a, of a hearing aid of some kind or actually restoring some degree of natural hearing? So when we're talking about hearing loss due to loss of those inner ear hair cells, we don't yet have ways of restoring hair cells in humans. It's been done in some other models, but we, don't, we can't do it yet in, here, in humans. So it is permanent in that sense, but we have lots of treatments uh, for it, ranging from hearing aids, uh, cer uh, certain types of hearing loss, there are surgery in the middle ear that can be effective, certain types where inner ear implants are, are effective. Let's take a look at a video question from one of our viewers. How do you fit earbuds to use with iPods and phones and all of the electronic equipment over your hearing aids? Interesting. So hearing aid, most of these things, and we should talk about it, go in the ear canal. Uh, does that rule out using uh, some sort of headphones? That does, but many of the digital devices now have systems that can feed them directly into your hearing aid. So you don't need a separate earbud. So if you're a hearing aid user and you want to use some type of digital device, speak with your audiologist or the hearing aid provider that provided you with that device, and they should be able to help you out with having it connect directly into your hearing aid. So what's new in, in hearing aids? Hearing aids, some of the new hearing aids have incredible quality. Uh, people might remember, I remember uh, when Bill Clinton got a hearing aid, put it in, and tossed it on the floor and stepped on it, I think. It was so lousy. I tried a hearing aid recently at one of our meetings. I don't need hearing aids yet, but I tried it on, and the sound quality was so amazing that I was thinking, gosh, you know, one day I'll get to use one of these things. The quality is terrific, and the aesthetics are, are great. People think now, used to always think, well, I want one of those really small ones that fit in the ear. Uh, nowadays, the ones that go behind the ear are aesthetically much more pleasing, much more subtle and their sound quality is just tremendous. I've seen pe people wearing, uh, presumably those, with a really tiny, as, as opposed to the, the TV yeah. size earpiece, there's a, just a little tiny uh, wire. Yeah, it's, 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 it's basically a small tube that goes down into the ear canal, very subtle, and the part that's behind the ear is so small and subtle that you don't really notice it tucked up in there. Now, there's also the ability to do an implant. When, when is that uh, useful for somebody who doesn't have perhaps a congenital type of, of hearing loss? So when we're talking again about inner ear hearing loss, all of this excludes problems with the bones of the middle ear or the eardrum, which might be correctable surgically. When you're talking about inner ear hearing loss, as a rule, if a conventional hearing aid is not going to work, there probably is some type of implant that would be available for you. The distinction about what type of implant depends uh, initially on whether you even have one ear that's working or not. So if you have one ear that's working really well and one ear that's not working at all and a hearing aid won't help it, there's one class of implants that might benefit you. If you have two ears that just aren't working at all and you can't use a hearing aid, there's a different class of implants that could help you. Let's squeeze in another phone call. This is Tina in Prince George's County. Tina, you're on. Go ahead. Hi. I just wanted to find out. Um, I have a senior, actually, who only experiences hearing loss on one side of her ear. She's in her 90s. So if there's anything she can do, I teach yoga. So I wanted to find out if there's any exercises or anything else we can Good phone call. Thank, thank you very much. How common is that? It's thank a one-ear problem. So that's a very common problem uh, for whatever reason. Age-related hearing loss is usually fairly symmetric, but there are many things that could lead to hearing loss in, in one ear. People who have hearing loss in one ear do really well in this kind of environment, but you get them in a restaurant where there are a lot of people talking and they just can't understand the one person they're trying to hear. Um, there are solutions for that. If a regular hearing aid doesn't work, uh, we have bone uh, implants, or what are called osseointegrated implants, which uh, sit in the bone of the skull, pick up sound, and send it to the other ear, to the good ear. So everything's going to their good ear, but because they're getting signals from both sides, it helps them a lot in that situation of background. Right. Dr. David Eisenman with the University of Maryland, thank you for being with us. 
Your Health segments are a co-production of Maryland Public Television and the University of Maryland Medical System. 